third speaker. So here at Deloitte Platform Engineering, we, and I'm sure in a lot of other spaces as well, we use um, Slack as a collaboration platform. Um, and I'm, and the wonders of it simply can't be overstated. Um, so for all those who are familiar with the platform, um, I think you might have some special interest in our next speaker. <laughs> I see her on screen already. Hi there, there. Um, so she's, Bear Douglas is currently the Director of Developer Relations at Slack and has worked there since 2017. Before that, she was Developer Advocacy Lead at Twitter, at Facebook before that. So, And she's going to be talking to us today about how Slack prefers to build APIs and workflows. So welcome, Bear. Take the stage away. Hi, thank you. Thanks for that kind introduction. Um, I'm going to share my screen, and then I would love it if you could all confirm that you can see that and it's looking good oh it's looking beautiful okay great <laughs> and you can hear me okay all right yeah well then thanks very much for having me um again hi my name is bear oh and i lead the developer relations team over at slack my pronouns are she and her and i've been at slack for three and a half years like Nicole said and in that time i've seen the product and the platform evolve quite a bit um, so I want to start by getting some context for all of you and giving you a bit of background about the history of Slack and how people have used it and how seeing the way that people used it has shaped the ways that we've designed Slack to be even more extensible by more people. So you may know that Slack was not originally set up as a company to build Slack. It was originally a company called TinySpec that made a game called Glitch. Uh, and if you've ever seen a four or four page for Slack, some of these trees in the animation style might look familiar because that's where Glitch lives on. But the tiny spec team that was building Glitch was split among offices in San Francisco and New York and Vancouver. And so like a lot of companies, they needed to, a way to stay in contact. So to do that, they were using IRC. And IRC basically works. You can chat with people on your team, you can divide content into topic channels and so on. But IRC has a bunch of limitations, like you don't get a searchable archive, you can't integrate other tools, and it's not really friendly to non-techies and so on. So the team had built some bots to try and work around those limitations. And as TinySpec was winding down and everyone was looking for what was next, they all realized that they never wanted to work somewhere where they didn't have access to these souped up IRC bots. So that is what eventually evolved into the Slack that we know and love today. We, we focus a lot on features that enable better collaboration, uh, building a nice UI layer for folks who are not techies. It's, it's pretty important to make Slack accessible to lots of different people. And there's native support for multiple platforms in, in addition to a lot of other features. But you see the echoes of the roots in IRC in a lot of different places. You see users and channels and messages. And then there's one feature in particular that calls back to IRC days, which is slash commands. So in IRC, all the platform native commands were issued with strings that started with a slash. And so we'd use that in Slack, but what we've expanded it to do is so it's not just for Slack native content. Uh, integrations through our API can leverage that and introduce their own slash commands. But they're intuitive to engineers or people who have used IRC before, but they're not familiar to everybody. Similarly, IRC gave us chatbots, which were bot users that could listen in channels and respond to certain commands. And a lot of early Slack users used a lot of bots, um, porting them over from IRC and services like Campfire or HipChat. Um, so there are some early commercial apps on Slack, like Poncho, the weather bot, which you can see here, that became successful by having personalities. And all the people who'd been used to using slash commands in chatbots in IRC and other chat platforms had a really easy time adapting to this new Slack world. And so we care a lot about these early tech-focused users who are our early adopters and made it successful. But Slack is increasingly being used across companies by lots of different teams, law firms, hospitals, restaurants, universities, all these types of organizations that are not just tech companies that use Slack to get their work done. And so we are very invested in making a way for everyone to be able to access the power of apps, those things that had made developers' lives a lot easier using Slack, like slash commands, like bots. And so if you fast forward to today, that vision that we had of making it possible for not just engineers, but anybody to build those types of shortcuts and workflows, that vision is coming true. So I'm gonna tell you three stories really quickly about companies who built internal apps that changed the way they work and how this has changed how we think about building our API for those use cases. So first, Vodafone, which is one of the world's largest multinational telecoms, they have 500 million customers. 
their DevOps team relies on Slack to maintain uptime, which is critical to customer trust. So they use PagerDuty and Datadog and some custom built apps to monitor and escalate incidents to the right teams inside Slack. So they've also built a custom app that integrates with AWS and other services. So engineers can spin up environments to production in just about 30 seconds. And as a result, they've been able to reduce their mean time to resolution from up to 20 minutes down to just five which is a huge improvement and a really impressive time to resolution. But it's not just DevOps teams that are doing this. Hearst Magazines has a portfolio of some 25 brands. Um, you may not know of Hearst off the top of your head, but you might know of Elle Magazine, for example, um, that has about 2,500 pieces of content created every single day across all those brands. So what they did is they built an app that helps get information about how all those stories are performing and how that content is doing and put it in the hands of employees. This app is called Hans, which is short for Hearst Answers, and it can respond to natural language questions like, what were the top performing stories on L yesterday? So users can ask Hans what's trending, executives can pull division-wide reports about how, how content is performing, and publishers can figure out which products and stories are generating the most e-commerce revenue. And so what's great about this is that it saves Hearst employees a ton of time, uh, an average of an hour a day. And beyond just saving time, um, this has led to huge gains across the division. There's been a nearly 50% increase in YouTube views and e-commerce revenue from articles that are cloned across brands because they're trending has nearly tripled since Hans was introduced. So that's obviously a large scale project that is in turn paying large scale dividends for Hearst. But there are simple things that you can do without development time that have big impact on how teams operate. DocuSign, even though they are a tech company, revamped their new hire onboarding with a completely low code no code tool that we have called Workflow Builder. They created a workflow where every time a new employee joined, they would show the new hire a list of locations where they could find documentation about the team and their active projects so they could get up to speed quickly. Um, they pop a form that has questions like, what's a fun fact about you? And then post it to the channel so that everyone can get to know this new person and say hi. And this just takes a couple of minutes to set up and it's made the DocuSign team get their employees ramped and connected with their teams a ton faster. So all this is super exciting for us because this vision that we had several years ago that chat ops, the ethos and practice could be accessible to non-engineering teams and non-engineering industries, it's starting to come true. And we're seeing customers build and use apps to do things like approve expenses or ship software, monitor key metrics, public break, publish news and manage retail stores and so on. But it took us a while to get there. And so in order for us to make it possible to get people to get more from Slack, we wanted to make things that feel like they should be easy, actually easy. So what does that mean? First of all, we should unpack, what does it feel like should be easy in Slack? The obvious thing is sending notifications. Slack is a communications and collaborations tool. When something happens that your team needs to know about and talk about, it helps to send it to Slack. So that should be easy. The next thing is rich data display. The basics like posting an image or a link to Slack should be super straightforward because catching up on Slack shouldn't feel like you're reading a textbook. It should feel interactive. There should be links, there should be movement and, and opportunities to interact. And so by that line of thinking, we also need simple interactivity to be simple. If I want to attach, for example, a confirm or deny button to a notification, that shouldn't be hard. So let's start with the middle one and what we did to address making that easy. The rich data display. So our clients do the right thing by default when someone posts a link, which is to say, if it's a publicly accessible URL, we'll go fetch the metadata at that URL for open graph or Twitter cards or whatever markup exists on the page. And then we reinflate that back in Slack. Easy, no work required. And if the link requires some sort of auth to view the content, like let's say it's a private metrics dashboard, uh, you can register an app with Slack to receive a notification when links from your domain are shared. And when that happens, you can give the user an option to log in and then once you know that the user is authorized, pass Slack what should be unfurled when that link is shared. It's a little more work, but it's very, very possible for all kinds of end users, technical or not, to get the value of apps and integrations because it's baked into link sharing. So moving back to the notifications piece, they are one of the most basic elements of working in Slack, receiving notifications. And so one of the decisions that we made early on was to create some apps that uh, 
would make it easy in our app directory to take care of all the boilerplate around setting up services to consume content from sources like an RSS feed and then route it to a Slack channel. So even if you were a non-technical end user, you could install the RSS app to your workspace, feed it the URL, map it to the channel, and then you're good to go. But a lot of services don't publish to RSS. A lot of modern software tools use webhooks to publish events to other services. So we wanted to make that super simple too. So in the Slack app dashboard, you can create an app and set up webhook URLs for particular channels. And because the last part of easy things easy is basic interactivity, we also allow you at that point to pass in what we call message attachments, which are just JSON blobs describing UI you want to display in Slack as part of the webhook payload. So taking it even one step further, we provide a GUI tool called the Block Kit Builder that will help you build that UI blob that you want to attach your webhook play payload. So in the Block Kit Builder, you can click on UI elements on the left-hand side of the screen and then add them to the canvas that's in the center. And then on the right-hand side, you can see the, the JSON that creates the, the UI in the middle and it updates live as you preview it. So you can send this message to a Slack channel to preview it live and try it out before even setting up your webhook. Again, easy things easy. We wanted to make it possible for people to just rely on templates for really common UI patterns inside Slack. We don't expect that everyone's familiar with the UI elements that we offer. And so the more help that we can give people to create well-designed apps that are pleasant to use, the better of an experience everyone will have. So when you click on that green button that says use message template, it will pre-populate that block kit builder from the window from the previous slide with the JSON you need to create this message. And then if you want to share designs with your friends, uh, it's all embedded in the URL. So you can copy paste the URL for your design and pass it back and forth to people you're working with. And then your current view is all re always reflected in that URL. So it's super easy to collaborate, super easy to create UI. And so now between all of those extra layers of tools, setting up a webhook with some amount of well-designed interactivity is as simple as two or three layers of copy pasting. So first we give you the post request that you can copy paste from the app management dashboard. And then the second copy paste that's highlighted in the pink is what you would get from the block kit builder. So our choices here around what tooling to build and what was worth investing engineering time into making super, super simple was informed by those use cases that we already saw people using in Slack. They wanted to consume event-based notifications from other services. And ideally they didn't want it to end there. Those notifications would have some notion of a next step. If you've got a notification, now what? There, there should be something that you can do based on that notification. So we put a lot of time and engineering effort into building the tooling support that makes this easy. But it makes it easy for engineers. <laughs> so the thing about webhooks is that even though they're a straightforward concept, the fact that they involve code is really intimidating for a lot of people who aren't engineers or who don't work in tech. And as I said before, one of our missions with the Slack platform is to make this transformative power of apps that's been available to engineers for quite some time available to everybody. So it's important to make things that we want everyone to be able to do feel accessible to everyone. So in 2018, we acquired a company called Missions and they made a product inside Slack that allowed you to automate tasks that involve some amount of custom logic without writing code. And that product today is incorporated into Slack into a tool we call Workflow Builder. And Workflow Builder was an important acquisition for us because it does a great job of boiling down workflows to its, its conceptual flow and stripping away the code so people can understand what they're setting up in a way that feels straightforward. So we introduced the concept of a trigger by making them concrete with specific events right away. You can trigger a workflow when somebody joins the channel or reacts to a message with an emoji or clicks on a shortcuts button in the message composer. Um, you can also set up triggers that are based on webhooks. So once a workflow has been triggered, users can add custom logic through the clickable GUI about what should happen next. Maybe send a message or open a form to capture more information. Um, that's what DocuSign did with their workflow to onboard new employees. Um, and other companies do it for things just like collecting information after a customer phone call or uh, reminding people to drink water at 10 a.m., whatever it is. Um, some of these are engineering use cases and, and others aren't. And just like with the Block Kit Builder, we wanted to make help users who weren't familiar with the product be successful from the get-go by providing templates. Um, power of templates cannot be overstated. When you give people ideas that are concrete about what they can do with your product so they can get started quickly and customize it, 
it takes a ton of effort around even learning what your product can do out of it. Um, and the interesting note is that we provided the ability to use templates from the very beginning. Those were published as files in our help center and they were downloadable files with a .json extension. And that confused a lot of people. Um, so bringing this template li library into the client directly so people never needed to download and re-upload it and changing the extension to .workflows, if you even see the download at all, has helped people get over that hurdle and that weirdness a lot more quickly. Um, so it's not just about making the templates available, it's about thinking about the user experience of pulling one in and being able to edit it. And we know that, or we hope, that there are people who will get used to workflows and then be able to trigger them from events and other services via, for example, a webhook. So at this point, if you're trying to set up a webhook notification for Slack, you have to do it in our developer site. You have to do it on api.slack.com. But from here, if you start this setup inside the client, bouncing you out to our developer site doesn't feel right. Um, so it makes much more sense to walk through the steps within Slack itself in this friendly feeling product that can help flatten the learning curve a little bit. So for people who are already comfortable with webhooks and how they work, it allows a next level of interactivity in Slack, again, with not much more effort than copy pasting JSON from Blockkit Builder. So through all of this, the thing that we were trying to, to optimize for was easy. We wanted something that felt easy to use, which is a lot to unpack. What is easy? So first things we considered were how many features to go to market with in the first release. Right now in Workflow Builder, there's no branching logic. The initial set of triggers that we launched with is fewer than 10. There are, there are only about five or six ways that you can start a workflow. And we decided to do that because we wanted that first release to feel really straightforward and limiting what it could do lowers the, the learning curve substantially as well. Um, so another thing that we found early on with Workflow Builder was that when we were trying to unpack what's intuitive or not about where workflows showed up and for whom and in what context, that was actually pretty hard because in a company of 100,000 people, if 5% of people build a workflow from, for themselves, that's 5,000 workflows floating around Slack. And so if you're trying to find yours, how do you do it? So we made the decision that workflows should be tied to channels so that we could keep everything neat and keep it easy to understand what content to expect where. So we had a lot of things to work through with admins too, like making sure that they had control and oversight over who in their organization could build workflows in the first place. And also that everything Workflow Builder touched stayed compliant with security features that everything else in the Slack client and the API touch like enterprise key management. So easy to use can be very hard to build, but the payoff, which is that millions of custom workflows are getting used monthly and a vast majority by people who have never created an app on uh, in our API site, that's a payoff that we think is absolutely worth all that effort. So the other side of the easy things should be easy is that instead of hard, let's say ambitious things should be possible inside Slack. So what do I mean by ambitious? Well, this is an app that the LA Times built in 2016 to 2017. And it's a tool that helps them publish stories directly from Slack. It's integrated tightly with their CMS and their editorial workflow channels. So editors get a feed of new stories coming in, and then they decide where on the latimes.com they should be published. And you can see from these buttons, there are a couple of names of columns. And when you click any of those buttons, it publishes it to that location on latimes.com. Mind you, this was in 2016, 2017. That was wild. It was absolutely transformative for editorial staff to be able to just be chatting with their team about the stories that are coming across their desks. And then without leaving Slack, without requiring any sort of code push or mucking around with WordPress, they could just click publish and send the story to print. And in time sensitive businesses like news publication, those minutes saved make a huge difference. So that's what I'd call ambitious. It's an app that has real transformational power for a team that really changes the way that they work. And this one was possible to build with the basics that we had in our API in 2017. What you basically need to build this app is a way to post messages to channels, check. Basic buttons, which required an event-based API to deliver click event information, also check. We needed message thread APIs and emoji reactions for some of the other features in the LA Times check, which check, check, and check. And that was amazing to see. But there were other ambitious apps that were bumping up a bunch of constraints in our API. So this is the SurveyMonkey app in 2017. And at the time, we would cite it as an example of amazing UX inside Slack. 
So what this GIF is showing you is the experience of picking a survey and then moving on to a task related to that survey, whether it's inviting collaborators or collecting responses and so on. And all of this had to happen in the context of a message. We had a system that we provided early on called attachments, everything with that colored bar on the side, which could be ripped and replaced when necessary. So this whole user story, this flow played out in the context of one message in a channel that just kept getting updated and updated and updated. And that is pretty hard to follow. It also made it hard that there were apps and channels that were trying to do things that were single player, like really only one person is interacting with this, but a channel is a multiplayer context. Then there were other apps like this early version of the Salesforce app that got around the constraint of the single player multiplayer by using ephemeral messages. You might have seen these in Slack where it says only visible to you. So what you're looking at here is a conversation between two people about an account. One person uses the Salesforce slash command to look up account information for that company. And then they see a few possible results. They pick the right one. The app confirms in an ephemeral message which one the person meant, and then they can choose to post the relevant data back to the channel. So only the person who called the slash command was able to see all of that interaction in the meantime. But if you're confused by this GIF, it's also confusing to use. And people were worried that things that they saw in channel because of this slash command would get posted for real instead of just to them. And it made people very tentative about using apps. So these types of apps were pushing the boundaries with the things that they needed from us. For example, they hacked together UI elements that we didn't offer, uh, like making emoji buttons a way to uh, create check boxes. So for example, if you have a button with an unchecked box emoji and then you click it and then you rip and replace the button with a, a checked box emoji, that's a way that they, they hacked around the fact that there weren't, uh, weren't check boxes inside messages. They also did things like editing and updating messages constantly, which would thrash channels full of people because the size of the message canvas might be changing at any time. And honestly, they just needed a lot more space inside Slack to use because messages, if you've ever been in a Slack channel, they scroll by. So if you update a message and it's already off people's screens, you as the developer don't know that that happened to the message and you don't know how to deal with that. So we had a lot of gaps to fill for our developers that we were seeing both in what they were telling us face to face, but also uh, in what we saw by the way they were designing their apps. So we rethought a few elements in the platform to redesign around these ambitious apps. We call it the Slack App Toolkit. And I'm not really gonna dig too much into our permissions model or shortcuts, but I am gonna tell you very quickly, as quickly as I can about BlockKit and some of the services that we designed to fix these issues. So before, when you just had the old message system, all you really had to play around with UI was these different ways that you could format text like code and bold and italics. And this information dense message is, is really, really difficult to read. And they got creative with emoji to try and make it more legible. But with BlockKit, they're made, able to make it much, much easier to read. So one of the things that we focused on was creating elements that we knew people lead, needed either for, for good layout, like the divider element, or for things that functionally weren't, weren't possible inside Slack before, like this date picker. And we designed it so they could be composable and stackable into views, um, like modals. So modals are popover windows that bring you out of the context of conversation to do more involved actions like search for information or put text into a form. And that makes sense when you have some amount of single player focused action that doesn't make sense in the channel. So there were cases where, where developers needed that single player mode. And there were also cases where they just needed more space. So what we uh, created was an entire window of the chat message with the app um, so that uh, apps can publish content there that doesn't need to be a user notification, but is available on demand. And so what you get is that this turns into much better UX for some pretty similar apps. So I'm hoping that this plays nicely. Um, you can see that this is a very similar case to the SurveyMonkey case from 2017, but now you're able to do it in one window that's not changing on you constantly. It's not being overreactive to what you're doing and then you can click send, and then you're done. And similarly, that search that we had before with the, uh, with the Salesforce app here becomes a modal, or, or becomes a message that launches a modal where you can dig into some of the search results and you have options to edit it right in here with this popover window. So all of this that we did was in response to the ways that we saw people were stretching our platform and they needed new APIs from us. And building this, carried a different set of challenges. 
Building Blockit was an effort that took well over a year and a lot of coordination across front end clients to work seamlessly from day one. Because the day that we launched Blockit for developers, we had to make sure that there were several mobile releases ahead of the developer release that supported Blockit so that if a developer built something, their end customers would be able to see those Blockit enabled messages on their phone and not have a broken experience on that first day. We also had to have consistent translation of design elements in each of the platforms that they'd appear in. Another thing that we did was we had to borrow an element of how ephemeral messages worked in order to make that popover window feasible. It would be an awful experience inside Slack if apps could just randomly pop windows up when you were working in Slack. It would be like, you know, your browser circa 1999 when every ad would just go boop, 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 boop. So we needed a way to require that they had to be triggered from user action. So we do that by publishing a trigger ID along with a user action like a button click that you use as kind of a, a pseudo token permission to be able to publish a modal to Slack. And since that already existed for ephemeral messages, uh, we borrowed it and we are using them now for modals as well. The other thing we needed were new events to be published in our API, like an event for when users visit that home tab space in the DM space, and of course events for when modal views were interacted with. And so doing all of this is not just about literally supporting them in the API. Possible is also about whether or not developers can build using the new tools you've given them. So we had to write a bunch of documentation explaining what these different services were outside messages, how you could publish to them, what the limitations were, and we had to create lots and lots of sample code. Because even though it's possible, it's, it's still complex. You can chain up to three dependent modal, modal views, which is great, it gives you lots of flexibility, but now you have a view stack that you have to manage that's happening all in Slack. And state management is still up to the developer. And so all of these bits of additional functionality are also adding complexity and it can be a longer time before people see the apps of these, the, the value of these apps that they're building for their team. So my message to all of you is don't go it alone. If you want to build cool things from your team, uh, you're, you're not the only one out there. And we have spent a lot of time trying to build up our community so that developers get the help that they need. Um, and you can find us at slackcommunity.com. We also have invested a bunch of time into first party SDKs that handle the work of authentication, handling rate limits and more inside Slack. We've got an app framework Bolt that's available in Node, Java and soon in Python that also provides middleware to help with event routing like when you're using interactive components like buttons. And our app Slack developer tools has useful features like ways to look up documentation from inside Slack or inspect element on a message. And so all of these things that we've done have been in the service of trying to make it easier and more possible, more accessible for developers to build with our API. And the investments that we've made and the way that we've, we've thought about making those investments has very much been colored by everything we learn from seeing all of you use the platform. So I know I'm bumping up right against time. So with all of that, I would just like to leave you with the fact that we're always here to help you can find us at slackcommunity.com. And if we have time for questions, I will happily take them. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Bear. Um, that was, that was an, as, a, as a user of Slack who uses it, well, every single day, it's amazing to figure out how much work actually goes into those intuitive displays. So thank you so much for that. Mm -hmm. I think we, oh, we've just hit 11.50, so we might not have time um, for any more questions. Um, we've had a bit of a back schedule here. So um, what I'd ask our viewers to do is, if Bear, if you'd like to maybe share your socials onto, this, uh, onto the state chat so yeah. that um, they'd be able to direct those questions to you and you can answer them at length. Um, or to, yeah, reach out to slackcommunity.com because clearly you guys are always there to help. <laughs> Sounds good. Awesome. Thank you All so right. much, Brett. That was great. Thanks so much.